Marcus Borg argues that the heart of Christianity is about practice and participation, not about believing a set of orthodox beliefs about the empty tomb. All Saints Church is a big tent, and as many people are here, we have that many opinions about what happened to Jesus' body on Easter Sunday morning. And I like that about All Saints Church. Hello, Bezel Triple Three. That was Rector Ed Bacon of All Saints Episcopal Church in Pasadena, California. You know, last week I ran into an old acquaintance of mine from the church of my youth, and I asked him if he was still going there. And he said no, as of recently he's been going to All Saints. Now, my heart sank as he said this because for all intents and purposes, a decision to attend All Saints is tantamount to rejecting the Christian faith once for all delivered to the saints. Now, if that sounds harsh or extreme, I, I can assure you it's not. Ed Bacon was quoting from Marcus Borg in the intro. Marcus Borg is the consummate liberal Bible scholar. He's a member of the infamous Jesus Seminar who teaches that the gospel documents are more myth than history. Borg maintains that the body of Jesus was most likely not raised from the dead. Here's Marcus Borg on the New Testament. And this understanding that stopped making sense to many of us is a literalistic understanding, either in hard form or soft form. Now, the hard form of biblical literalism is the insistence that everything the Bible says is the absolute will of God, and that if it says something happened, then that thing really happened. So it's very much concerned with factuality as well. And at some point, for most of us in mainline churches, that understanding of the Bible that we acquired as children simply stop being persuasive to us. Shorthand for that understanding of the Bible, of course, is biblical literalism. And again, it exists in both harder and softer forms. Borg's contention that biblical literalism, which stopped being persuasive to modern mainline intellectuals, is nothing less than the way Jesus himself looked at Scripture. Since Jesus proved his claim to be God and man by raising himself from the dead, there is no higher authority as to what the Bible is all about. So how did Jesus teach Old Testament stories? Did he simply think of them as mythological, or in fact did he regard them to be real historical narrative? Well, let's take a couple of examples. First, what were his thoughts concerning Adam and Eve? Matthew 19, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? You know, there's no question that Jesus believed that the story of the creation of Adam and Eve as our first parents is historically true. How about Noah and the flood in Matthew 24? For as were the days of Noah, so will be the, the coming of the Son of Man. For in those days before the flood, there were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. Again, it's pretty clear that Jesus taught that Noah was a historical figure and that the world was destroyed by a massive flood and uses that to describe the way it will be when he himself returns in glory. It's always been the more than literal, the more than factual meaning of these stories that had mattered most. I sometimes speak of this as the parabolic meaning of scripture. We all know that parables, the parables of Jesus, aren't factually true. I don't know any Christian who would argue that the parable of the prodigal son had to happen, otherwise it's not worth paying attention to. But we all recognize that those stories are truthful in the sense of being truth-filled. So also to read the Bible within a historical metaphorical framework is to recognize that the Bible is full of parabolic truth-filled stories, stories that are told because of their surplus of meaning. You see, Jesus gave his disciples instructions on what the New Testament would be about. In John's Gospel, we have Jesus promising his disciples that the Holy Spirit will bring to their minds all the things that Jesus had taught them. John 14, These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. 
Jesus prays not only for his disciples, but for all who will believe Jesus through their word, first spoken and then written down and passed on to us, us in the New Testament documents. John 17, sanctify them in the truth, said Jesus. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, Father, so I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in truth. He goes on in verse 20 of 17. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, the disciples, that they may be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may be in us so that the world may believe that you've sent me. So, having said all that, and with Borg as background, I give you Ed Bacon's sermon on Easter Sunday, 2013. Happy Easter, everyone! Happy Easter! Well, so much for the traditional uh, proclamation from the pastor on Easter Sunday. He has risen! Which the congregation replies, He has risen indeed! But there's a reason that Ed uses the generic Happy Easter greeting. It's been a, a great, thrilling day to have interfaith visitors. My soul friend, Dr. Nazar Kaja, who is um, a great international Muslim leader, is here in the second pew. We've had Muslim leaders, Jewish leaders, and at the 7 a.m. service, a new couple came out uh, and greeted me and uh, I said, are you Muslim? And she said, no, I'm Buddhist and he's Hindu. <laughs> and we really enjoyed being here. You see, folks, what we have here is an interfaith service. And at an interfaith service, the trick is to talk only about those things which all kinds of people can agree. The preaching of the bodily resurrection of Jesus will not be one of them. H. Richard Niebuhr said, a God without wrath brings people without sin into a kingdom without judgment to a Christ without a cross, and in this case, a bodily resurrection. Now, I want you to listen for these themes I just mentioned as we continue. Last night at our 7.30 Easter vigil, we had a 93-year-old rabbi who had lived a lot of his life in Russia. And the Christians after the Easter vigil being stirred up about um, the Jews being Christ killers would go into his Jewish neighborhood and beat up the Jewish men and he came here and he wanted to have a different experience of Christians and Easter we are so grateful for the graces that God gives us here at All Saints and helps us to understand that God was serious and is serious when God speaks about love for a L L. What about that does Christianity not get? <laughs> you know, as a Christian who actually believes what the Bible teaches, I do get that, Ed. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal or everlasting life. But, Ed, please, don't stop there. What does the text say next? It says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. You see, Ed, people who do not believe in the name of Jesus are judged, and we will see are condemned already. I'm going to refer you to some Old Testament passages. Psalm 7, God is a righteous judge and a God who has indignation every day. If a man does not repent, he will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. Or Proverbs 3.33, triple three. It tells us here that the curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. Now the question is, who are the wicked and who are the righteous? Well, let's hold that question for a moment. 
When Marcus Borg visited us two weeks ago, he and I enjoyed some lengthy one-on-one conversations. In one of the conversations, we fell into talking about spiritual practices. Guys, Ed Bacon hitching his wagon to Marcus Borg places him squarely in the category of ultra-liberal Protestants who heartily reject any form of orthodox Christian doctrine. Dr. Borg's understanding of Christianity is that it is not about being rewarded with heaven or hell because you believe or don't believe the right things about Jesus and God. Now, if you're asking yourself, why is Ed Bacon preaching uh, Dr. Borg and what he believes about the Bible? Well, the simple answer is that Dr. Borg does not believe the Bible, and either does Ed Bacon. So, what else is Ed to do on an Easter Sunday? Christianity certainly is not about God sending Jesus to earth to be executed on the cross as some kind of cosmic payment for the sin of humanity. You see, the Bible has a very different answer. John 3, 36, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Again, the Bible teaches otherwise. 1 John 4, 10, And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Or go back to the second chapter of 1 John. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, not only for ours, but also for those of the whole world. Now, that word propitiation is very specific. It is an act of meeting or satisfying the demands of God's righteous judgment for the infinite offense of sinning against God's commands. God does not need a sacrificial payoff as some satisfaction to cool down divine wrath, as if God had an anger management problem? God does not have an anger management problem, Ed. The problem here is that you ignore the greatness of God's holiness and righteousness and the inky black depths of human sinfulness. God, the real God, the vast mysterious God happens to be bigger than having neurotic issues with anger and punishment. So believing a set of beliefs is not the road to wholeness or salvation. I'm sorry, but the Bible contradicts you, Ed. The Apostle John uses the Greek verb believe almost 100 times. The first occurrence is John 1.50, where Jesus says to Nathanael, because you said that I saw you under the tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. The word means to be persuaded, to have confidence in, and to have committed trust. It means to believe in the gospel of Jesus, the good news, and it is a particular set of beliefs. In fact, according to Marcus Borg, before the year 1600, the verb to believe did not mean to believe something to be true. The object of the verb was not an idea, statement, or a theory, but it was a person. To say that we believed someone meant that we trusted them prior to 1600, felt loyal to them and loved them. Borg says, most simply, to believe meant to beloved, as in we beloved one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth of all things, visible and invisible, or John 3.16, For God so loved the world that God gave the only begotten Son, so that whosoever beloved, trusted, gave their life in loyalty over to him, would have this thing called everlasting life, which we'll talk about later. That's a very different matter than believing a set of beliefs about Jesus. Now that is full strength, 120 proof, moonshine hooey. As I just said, the Greek verb believe is to have confidence in and reliance upon the good news of Jesus. Here's another passage that contradicts what Ed is saying here. In John chapter 2, we have Jesus cleansing the temple of, uh, of the money changers who were in there when he walked through. <coughs> Excuse me. The Jews ask by what authority he is doing this. And Jesus replies to them this way. 
Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And the Jews said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And, and now here's my point. In verse 22 of John chapter 2, So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures, Old Testament scriptures, and the word which Jesus had spoken. They believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Do you get that? It's the equivalent of a set of beliefs, my friends. If you want to do something eternal, if you want to live in eternity right the second, all you have to do is base your life and practices on love and on love's expressions, and you have already passed from death to life. So says the Bible. Base your life on love and love's expressions? But what the Bible teaches is this, John 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and has not come into judgment, but is passed out of death into life. Now, whether or not Borg or Bacon like it, there's that pesky word judgment again. You can't escape it, fellas. From Genesis to Revelation, there is both sin and grace, blessing and curse, judgment and justification. Now there's something about having a relationship in which another person always sees you in your best light. Not a false light, and certainly not without your faults, but framing all your choices in their best light. And when that happens, there's a change that transpires. I want to do better in the face of someone who sees me in my best light. In fact, I do do better. And when I, as a spiritual practice, as a way of participating in Jesus' resurrected life and way of being, put absolutely everyone in their best light, I see the world very differently. I see. The Easter story, according to Ed Bacon, is all about seeing everybody in their best light. Because after all, everybody's beautiful. Everybody's beautiful in their own way. There are many meanings to the resurrection. Many meanings to the resurrection? The Bible is concerned with only one, Ed. Resurrection, which is anastasis in the Greek, means raising up or rising. Peter, in his Pentecost sermon, spoke of King David who looked forward to the resurrection of the Messiah when he said in Acts 2, he, David, looked ahead and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades nor did his flesh suffer decay. This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured forth this which you both see and hear. Or Paul in Philippians 3, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. You see, you cannot have a resurrection, at least a decent one. You know, uh, he raised uh, as, as, we, as the flowers raise up again every spring. No, I'm talking about a real bodily resurrection. You cannot have a real resurrection without first having been physically dead. In short, this is the only biblical meaning of resurrection. But one for sure is that particularly in this morning's lesson, Jesus, prior to his crucifixion, in his relationship with Mary Magdalene, had been the means for Mary Magdalene to see herself in her best light. Jesus' love did that for her. And now, after Jesus' tomb time, Jesus chooses to appear to Mary in the garden, in the cemetery, early this morning. 
tomb time? Jesus appears to Mary early this morning? Notice how Ed tries to remove this account from its historical moorings in order to make it allegorical. This is the only place where Ed refers to the John 20 passage, and sadly it gets much worse from here. She has come to the garden with what Richard Rohr would call her false self, her dualistic mentality, her fear mind, her conventional me mind that is not open to the miracles that love unconventionally and controversially creates. Look at John 20. Nowhere will you find any allusion to Mary's false self, her dualistic mentality, or her fear mind. Yeah, I shouldn't wonder that Ed is quoting from emergent Roman Catholic mystic Richard Rohr. Here is Rohr in rare form. Christ is not Jesus' last name, all right? Jesus became the Christ. So this, of course, gives us our foundation for interfaith dialogue, for the understanding that God has been working in all of history since the beginning of time. To put it very concretely, the Christ is born the moment God decides to show himself, the moment God decides to materialize. Now, modern science would call that the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang is the birth of Christ, 14.5 billion years ago. And this material manifestation has been revealing the glory of God, the nature of God, for at least 14.5 billion years. That's the cosmic Christ. So in a moment of time, this cosmic Christ is revealed for us in a human person that we could see and touch and hear and listen to and fall in love with. But in the first 2,000 years, most of the work except for the mystics, who largely got this. You know, mainline Christianity, Catholic and Protestant, has largely been concerned about Jesus, the historical person, which is good. But what we missed out on was the cosmic Christ, which would have given us a much more uh, immense understanding of salvation, of how God is revealing and loving through everything that is, through creation. And salvation isn't just a human concept, it's a historical concept, it's a global concept. God is liberating and loving through everything that God created. Mary's mind at this point can't conceive that Jesus could possibly be alive. Her paradigm is closed off to any other option. So the only option, the limitations of her mind will allow her to think is that this guy standing before her in the cemetery garden is the gardener. Well, so what? Because as far as Ed is concerned, the guy standing before her in the garden is not a real person anyways. If Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified, died, and was laid in a tomb for three days, has not been raised from the dead, then Ed's so-called Christian faith is worthless. It's in vain. He might as well be talking about Luke Skywalker or Katniss Everdeen. Last Tuesday, when I listened to the recording of the arguments for marriage equality before the Supreme Court, I wanted to fly certain Supreme Court justices to all saints to live with us here for a month. <laughs> just so we could show them that we are not conducting some sort of social experiment here. <laughs> when we marry same-gender couples here, we're experiencing resurrection. Resurrection love between a man and a man and a woman and a woman in its best light. Now, it's absolutely heartbreaking to hear this being preached on an Easter Sunday. You know, aside from the fact that the Bible prohibits homosexuality along with all other sexual sin, Ed has the utter audacity to link same-sex marriage with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There are no words to describe how far this pastor has fallen from grace. The, the important thing about this morning is whether or not we realize that the meaning of this morning is that love is stronger than death. And love and grace trump fear and the grave. And whether that leads us to put others in their best light, light like Jesus put Mary Magdalene in her best light, and then was called by Jesus to do that to others. We are called to that kind of participatory resurrection, not spectator resurrection. I'm sorry. Ed, we will indeed participate in the resurrection, but only after we die. These are the words of Jesus himself. 
He says in John 5, Don't marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who did good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Now remember, we asked that question, who are the righteous and who are the wicked? We're going to get to that in just a second. You see, my friends, the message of today is that you and I were made in love, by love, and love is our deepest truth. Love is our true self. Love is the strongest power in our soul. Love is our best light. And the way we participate in the resurrection, instead of just observe it, is to put every human being we know in the world into the best light so that they can participate in the resurrection too, so they can discover inexhaustible love inside them. You know, it's curious, but nowhere in this sermon does Ed even mention the Acts 10 passage. But I would be more than happy to do it. So let's start at verse 38. You know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him, and we are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become visible, not to all the people, but to witnesses who were chosen beforehand by God, that is, to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he ordered us to preach to the people and solemnly to testify that this is the one who has been appointed by God as judge of the living and the dead. Of him all the prophets bear witness that through his name everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Friends, it is Jesus of Nazareth, God in flesh, who has been appointed as judge of the living and the dead preaching resurrection as putting people in their best light will not, I repeat, will not save you from your sin and the guilt and punishment that will come as a result of it. Jews and Muslims and Hindus and even atheists feel comfortable at All Saints for one reason and one reason alone. Jesus and Him crucified because of our sins and transgressions and raised from the dead for our justification by the power of God as the only way of salvation is not preached and in fact flat out denied. You see, the answer to who is righteous and who is wicked, according to the scriptures, is simple. We are all wicked apart from the grace of God in Jesus Christ. We are wicked because of original sin, that we're connected to Adam. We are part of this fallen creation because of the rebellion of our first parents. And we are God's enemies because of our actual sins, the sins we commit every day in thought and word and deed. And you see, Ed never preaches that God is your enemy due to your rebellion against his holy law and the offense it brings to his infinite righteousness and justice. Ed never preaches that this, this is true for every person who is not trusting in Jesus Christ the Lord. You know, the words of Jeremiah 6 ring true here about Ed Bacon. Behold, their ears are closed and they cannot listen. Behold, the word of the Lord has become a reproach to them. They have no delight in it. And from the prophet even to the priest, Everyone deals falsely. They have healed the brokenness of my people superficially, saying, peace, peace, but there is no peace. Now, I'm sorry, I've gotten all blustered up and, and hot and bothered because of this, but I have a friend who has forsaken the gospel, and he's hearing this kind of pablum that won't do anything for his soul. You know, the reality is, our greatest need, the forgiveness of sin, is denied at All Saints, then this is what you get. This is what you're going to get on an Easter Sunday, that resurrection is seeing people in their best light, which will do nothing, nothing to shield you against God's wrath on the last day. But let me turn the corner here. Don't despair. Don't despair. 
because there's really good news in the scriptures. The Apostle Paul says this in his letter to the Ephesians. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Jesus Christ, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. That's the Easter message, folks. That's what Ed Bacon should be preaching if he calls himself a Christian pastor. If you're attending All Saints, repent of your sin of apostasy and find a church that, that preaches Christ and Him crucified as the only way of salvation from the wrath of God.